Today, we're going to finally talk about encryption. And the scenario in encryption is that you have two different people and they want to send messages to each other. So let's say I have two people. Let's say this is Alice and this is Bob. So I have Alice here and I have Bob. And let's say that Alice knows a message M that she wants to send to Bob. And generally, in this course, I'm going to use the color red to show that something is a secret. And if something is not a secret, I'll just show it in blue. So Alice wants to send this message M to Bob. But the problem is that she only has a public channel or an unsecured channel. Let's say they are connected only via the internet. And any message that Alice sends to Bob can be read by someone else. And that's someone else we're going to call her Eve. So Eve is an eavesdropper. And she can basically see anything that goes through this channel. So if you send any message here, it will be intercepted by Eve and Eve can uh, see exactly what you sent. So you can imagine that this public channel, which is unsecured, is maybe the internet. And if you're sending a message using the internet, your ISP, your internet service provider can see it. If you're using the network in the university, maybe the university can see it. Your government can see it. Let's say um, the operators of the uh, underwater cables that are used for the internet, they can see it. So this Eve can basically be anyone who has access to the channel and can intercept the messages. Now, of course, the problem is that uh, this message is a secret. So let's say, I don't know, consider that your Alice and Bob is your email provider. So, uh, or sorry, vice versa. Let's say Alice is the email provider and Bob just wants to read his email. So this message should not be visible to anyone else. We have to make sure that the only person who can see this message is Bob. Now, of course, that means that I cannot send this message through this channel because as soon as I send it, then Eve would see it. So instead, I have to send some other message through this channel. And let's call that other message, uh, let's call it E because it's encrypted. So the idea is that I take my original message M and I somehow encrypt it to get some other message E and then I send E through the channel. So now E is public. Everyone knows E. Uh, Eve knows what the value of E is and Alice and Bob know it. And generally we assume that uh, it's completely public and everyone knows what it is. Okay. Now at this point, Bob should be able to calculate M based on E, right? But the problem is that Bob doesn't have any kind of information that is not public. So any information that Bob has, Eve has the same information as well. So if Bob can somehow uh, find the original message M by decrypting E, then Eve would be able to do the same thing. So I need to make sure that there is some other secret shared between Alice and Bob that Eve doesn't know and then I'm going to use that secret to do the encryption and the decryption. So we call this usually a secret key and let's show it with K. So at the beginning, I just assume that both Alice and Bob know a shared key K and this is why we call it symmetric encryption because uh, they both have the same key. And then when Alice wants to send the message M, she's going to somehow encrypt it hopefully using the key K. And then this encrypted message E is going to be sent to Bob. Now, Bob is the only one who knows K other than Alice. So she, he should be able to now decrypt E and get back M. But we are assuming that Eve cannot do this. Okay. So let's actually try to formalize this mathematically a little bit. So I'm going to assume that first of all, we have a key that is known by both Alice and Bob. So both Alice and Bob know a secret key K. 
a secret. And again, as usual, everything is a string. So I just assume that my key is a string. Generally speaking, I have strings of zeros and ones. So I can think of my key as a string or I can think of it as a natural number because of course it's just a number in binary. And I will switch between these two different views. So sometimes I think of my key as a string, sometimes I think of it as a number. And generally in this course, whenever I say number or string, they're the same, okay? So both of them know a secret key. And additionally, I want to be able to do encryption and decryption. So I want to say that Alice knows how to encrypt. So Alice knows an algorithm uh, or a function that's used for encryption. So I'm going to just call it ENC for encryption. And this function or algorithm basically uses the key K and it maps strings to strings. So given the key K, Alice can take any message M and she can encrypt it. And that would give the encryption of M, which we call E. And then on the other hand, I would of course like Bob to be able to decrypt it. So I'm going to say that Bob knows an algorithm Let's call this algorithm decryption or DEC. And this algorithm also uses the key K and it maps encrypted strings to decrypted strings. Now, what is the property that I want to have? It's very obvious. It's just that if I encrypt something and then I decrypt it with the same key, I want to get the original message back. So I want to say that for any possible message M, for every message M, I want to say that if I first encrypt M using the key K, and then I decrypt the result using the same key, this should give me M. Pretty obvious, right? Now, here's the thing. This is not really giving us any security because I can just say that my encryption and decryption algorithms, uh, they don't change the message at all. Let's say they're the identity function. So I can say that the encryption of M is M and the decryption of M is also M and I will satisfy this property. So all this property is saying is that if I encrypt and then decrypt, I get the same message back, but it doesn't say that I'm going to have any security. It doesn't say that if doesn't find any information about the message in. Okay, so I need to have some security properties, but before getting to that, I want to say a few words about this algorithms. So in the early days of cryptography, there was this idea that we can make the algorithms private. We can keep the algorithm as a secret. Now that happened to be a really bad idea because imagine if your decryption algorithm is a secret and suppose that somehow it's leaked, then you have to change your entire system. You have to come up with a new algorithm just so that you can do decryption and encryption again. And that's very costly. I don't want to change my algorithm every time. And I mean, people are not good at keeping secrets. So it might happen that Bob just leaks the algorithm, right? So nowadays the standard is that the algorithms are always public. So everyone knows the algorithm. Uh, so these algorithms, both of them, both the encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm are public. Okay. So uh, specifically I'm assuming that Eve also knows uh, these algorithms, but what's private is the secret key. So the secret key K is private. Maybe I should have written it in red. So I can write it in red. K is private. Now, if our only secret is the key, this is much better because if the key is leaked, no problem. I'll just use another key for next time, right? I don't have to design a completely new encryption and decryption algorithm. Okay. So now based on this idea that the algorithm is public and everyone knows our algorithm, but the key is private, we want to say that Eve cannot find uh, our message M. 
And this is what we call the weak security property. So the weak security property is that given the encrypted message E, which is the result of encrypting M by the key K, it should be impossible to compute M. So all this is saying is that Eve cannot decrypt the same way that Bob can. So Bob can use the, K, uh, the key K to decrypt, but Eve doesn't have the key K. So she only has access to the encrypted message E. And what I'm saying is that if you only know this encrypted message E, it should be impossible to compute the decrypted message, the original message in. Or I can be more specific and I can say it's impossible to compute this without knowing K. Okay. But as you see here, I'm calling this a weak security property because actually it's possible that I cannot create uh, the entire message. Maybe I cannot compute M, but maybe I can find some information about M. So based on what uh, this encryption algorithm is doing, maybe I can find, let's say, the parity of M. Maybe I can figure out that M is going to be odd or even. That's already finding some information about M, right? And even that is not good enough for us. So if I'm leaking some information, even if I'm not leaking my entire message, even if Eve cannot compute M, uh, it's still giving Eve some idea about what the message was. And uh, even that can have security implications. So I don't want to allow that. I want to make sure that Eve cannot find any information about it. And this is what we call the strong security property. So the strong security property is that given E, it is impossible to find any information about M. So not only I cannot find M itself, I cannot know if M is odd or even. I cannot know, uh, or okay, another way of looking at this is that I cannot rule out any of the possibilities for M, okay? Now, generally speaking, we also assume that uh, everyone knows the length of the message. So that's not considered a leak. If Eve can figure out what the length of the message M is, that's fine. But other than that, we want to say that it's impossible to find any information about it. So if I'm sending a message with n bits, basically I want to say that Eve cannot distinguish between all the two to the power of n possibilities for that message. Okay, how do we actually achieve this? Well, this is one of the simplest algorithms in all of cryptography and it's called a one-time path. So in one-time path, I have a message M and I have a key K and I'm assuming that the length of the message and the key uh, is the same, or let's say the key is longer than the message. And when I want to encrypt, I just use XOR. So in a one-time pad, I would say that the encryption of a message M using the key K is simply defined to be M XOR K. I use this for XOR. Okay. If my encryption is just XORing my message with my key, what would my decryption be? So if I want to, let's say this was E, the result of encrypting M. If I want to decrypt E, what should I do? Just tell me in the chat. So remember, I need this property. I need to say that if I encrypt something and I decrypt it, I'll get the same thing back. Yes, you're right. So my decryption here should be exactly the same as my encryption algorithm, which is just take whatever value you have, 
and XOR it with the key, right? And based on this, you can easily check that we have the property that we were looking for, which is like, if I encrypt M and then decrypt it, so the result of decryption using K, of encryption using K of M, is just going to be, well, encryption using K of M is M XOR with K. But then if I decrypt it using K, I just get M XOR with K twice. But in XOR, these two cancel out, so I just get M. Okay. So very simple algorithm. Uh, pretty obvious that I can do this. Now let's just do a security analysis. Let's see if we have our weak security property and if we have our strong security property. So our weak security property says that uh, only Alice and Bob know K, Eve doesn't know K, Eve only knows E, which is the encryption using K of the message M. So Eve knows M, X, or K. Now, uh, we want to say that by knowing M, X, or K, she cannot compute M without knowing K. Now, here's the part where things get interesting. Let's just do a proof by contradiction. Let's say that she could compute M. If she can compute M, since she also knows E, she can just X or E mm. and M, and that would give her K. Mm. This is she also knows K. Okay. So, uh, sorry, could you mute yourself? Someone is talking. Okay. So, uh, basically, decrypting without knowing the key is as hard as knowing the key here. So, we do have our weak security property. Or another way of looking at this is that if I don't know this key K, it's pretty much impossible to decrypt. Okay. But do we have the strong security property? So uh, I have to be a little bit more specific when I'm talking about the strong security property. And what I want to say here is this. I want to say, suppose Eve sees some message E. So Eve sees the encrypted message E, and she sees that this is a message of length N. OK. Now, she already knows that our original message was also of the same length and that's fine. I don't consider that a leak. So uh, what does Eve know? From her point of view, there are two to the power of n possibilities for m. Right? So my original message m, it has a length of n. And it's in binary, so I have two to the power of n possibilities for what m could be. So I have the strong security property if Eve cannot rule out any of these possibilities. So that's what I want to prove here. I want to prove that from Eve's point of view, any possible in any of these two to the power of n uh, strings is possible to be m. So I want to say Eve cannot rule out any possibility. Another way of looking at this is that suppose I send two different messages. Suppose uh, I were to send M1 and M2. Eve cannot distinguish between M1 and M2. Okay, now why is this the case? This is the case because no matter what the encrypted message E is, Eve doesn't know the key K. So uh, for any possible initial message M, there is actually a particular key K that would give us E. So this is what I want to say. I want to say that formally for every possible message M, there exists some key and this key can depend on M. Uh, such that the encryption of M using this key is E. So basically this means that when uh, Eve is seeing this encrypted message E, 
she cannot know which one of the original messages were used because any one of the original messages are possible. Okay. So what is my key KM here? Just tell me in the chat, what should I use for KM? Yes, M, X, or K. Well, M, X, or E, right? M, X, or E. And you can see it uh, by just plugging this in. So if I encrypt M using KM, so the encryption of M using the key KM is just M XOR with KM. But KM is itself M XOR with E. So this is M XOR with M XOR with E, but the two M's cancel out. So for any possible message M, there is at least one key KM such that if I had that particular key, I would get this encryption. And of course, uh, Eve doesn't know the key K, so she cannot distinguish between the messages that we're sending. Now, very importantly, this security analysis works only when you're sending one message. So I'm using this key K to send exactly one message, but it doesn't work if I'm sending two messages. So let's see what happens if I send two messages. And by the way, this is why we call it a one-time pad because you, you can use this only for one message and only for once, you cannot reuse it. So uh, this is a very important thing in this lecture to remember, do not reuse your keys. So here's what can go wrong. Suppose that I send two different messages using the same key. So I have Alice on this side as before and Bob on this side. And let's say that Alice has two messages, M1 and M2. And she also has a key K and Bob knows the same key. Now Alice wants to send M1. So she encrypts it. And that's basically M1 XOR with K and sends it to Bob. Now let's say that she uses the same key to encrypt M2. So she's sending M2 XOR with K to Bob. And again, just as before, Eve can see everything that's going on in here. So Eve sees M1 XOR with K and M2 XOR with K. What can Eve do now? Eve can take these two numbers and she can XOR them together. So she can take M1 XOR with K and XOR it with M2 XOR with K. But now we have XOR, so this K and this K cancel out. So she gets M1 XOR with M2. Now she doesn't actually get M1 or M2. So in some sense, Maybe we have the weak security property, but we don't care about the weak security property. We care about the strong security property. So we want to make sure that Eve cannot find any information about our messages. But now Eve has found the XOR of our messages. And that's some information because now she can rule out a lot of the possible combinations of messages. And you can imagine that if these messages were English words or if they were English sentences, Knowing their XOR is actually going to give you a lot of information. It gives you a lot of possibilities to maybe uh, be able to guess what M1 and M2 were. And also, the other thing is it, it gets even worse if you continue doing this. If you send a lot of different messages using the same key, then Eve can find the XOR of any two of your messages. And that again gives Eve a lot of possibilities for uh, brute forcing or doing a dictionary attack or anything like that. So uh, in any case, formally speaking, if Eve can rule out any possibility for the messages or the combination of messages, she has found some information about the message and that's leaking, that's not acceptable for us. So it's not acceptable to leak the XOR of the messages. So you should not reuse your keys. 
make sure that for every message you use a new key. So this is a leak. Again, I'm saying this a hundred times. This is the most common problem that I see uh, in the protocols that are designed in the homework. So make sure that you don't use the same key more than once here. It's a one-time path. Okay. Now we have a problem, right? So our problem is that we need to have a shared key, but what if we don't have it? Right? So uh, let's say I want to uh, interact with a website. Let's say I want to again read my email. I'm going to get a lot of different messages from this website. And if I need a new key for every one of them, I have to have a ton of shared keys with this website, and maybe I don't. I mean, normally you don't have that, right? So if you're connecting to the internet and trying to check out your email, you don't know uh, a lot of shared keys with Gmail. So now the question is, how can we actually get some shared keys? So this is the problem of key exchange. So imagine the same situation as before. Let's say I have Alice and I have Bob here. So Alice is here, Bob is here. And initially they don't have anything in common. They haven't communicated before. And let's say that I have the same unsecured channel in between. And I also have Eve who can see anything that goes through this channel. Okay. Now, what do I want to do? I want to have a shared secret between Alice and Bob. But I can't do that, uh, at least not yet. What I can do for sure is that I can just ask Alice to create a secret on her own. So let's say Alice just generates some random number. Let's call it A. And this is a secret that only Alice knows. And I can ask Bob to do the same thing. So Bob also creates a secret B. Now, Alice should not send A to Bob. Because if she does that, then Eve would see the secret A. So instead, I'm going to say Alice just applies some function to A and sends the result of that to Bob. So let's say Alice sends some F of A to Bob. OK, so this is my first step. Alice computes some F of A and sends it to Bob. We will talk about what this function has to be later on. But generally speaking, uh, I want to make sure that this F doesn't really leak A. Uh, we've previously used hash functions for this. This F is not going to be a hash function. We'll see something else soon. But uh, the idea is that Alice has to send something to Bob. Uh, and she cannot send the secret. So let's just apply some function to the secret and send the result of that function. And let's say that Bob does the same thing. So let's say that Bob also applies the function f to b and sends it to Alice. Okay. So Bob uh, sends f of b to Alice. And Bob can compute f of b because he knows b. Now, here's the thing. I want to be able to get a shared secret. So I want to have, at some point, a shared secret k that both Alice and Bob know. But right now, we don't have a shared secret. But if you look at what each party knows, we have a difference in the knowledge of the parties. So Alice knows a. And she also knows f of a, of course. And she also knows f of b. Bob knows b, f of a, and f of b. Eve only knows f of a and f of b. So you see, uh, we have a disparity. Each one of the two parties knows at least one of the secrets, but Eve doesn't know any of the secrets. So we want to use this to create our key k. I want to say that we define k. key k to be a value 
that is easy to compute if you know one of the two secrets, such that, so first, I want to say K is easy to compute if you know F of A and B, or if you know F of B or A, uh, or sorry, if you know F of B and A. Right? So basically I want to say that both Alice and Bob can compute K because Bob knows F of A and he knows the secret B. Alice knows the secret A and she knows F of B. But the second property I want to have is that Eve cannot compute K. So K is hard to compute or it is impossible to find any information about K. K is hard to compute. If you only know the public information, if you only know F of A and F of B. Okay. So this is the property that I want to have. This is my security property. Now, how do we actually reach this? Well, I'm going to give you one way of doing it. This is called the Diffie-Hellman-Merkel key exchange. And I mean, I want you to just appreciate that this sounds impossible, but this is actually something that we can do in cryptography and it's the basis of a lot of cryptographic protocols. So here's uh, how we're going to do this. Let me again, draw this Alice and Bob figure. So let's say I have Alice on this side. I have Bob on this side. Um, okay. This is Alice. This is Bob. Now we're going to start by choosing a really large prime number. And I can say that the prime number is chosen by either Alice or Bob. It doesn't matter because I want to make the prime number public and known to everyone. So my first step is uh, actually was one. Let's say Alice or Bob, it doesn't matter which one. Let's say Bob does it. Bob chooses a large prime number P. And this prime number should be really large because I want to do all of my calculations modulo P. So from this point onwards, I want to say, instead of sending a string or a number, I'm always working with the remainder of that number modulo P, okay? But that's fine because you can easily generate really large prime numbers. So Bob uh, creates this prime number and sends it to Alice. So Bob is sending this prime number P to Alice. Okay. But of course the problem is that anything that you send here will be intercepted by Eve. So Eve definitely sees this prime number. Okay, let me use a different color. Okay. Now, other than this prime number, I'm going to also do something else, which is a little bit strange at this point, but you will get used to it. So Bob doesn't just choose a, a large prime number P. He also chooses what we call a primitive root. So he also chooses some number G. And this number G is going to be between zero to P minus one, because remember all of our numbers are now going to be modulo P. But Additionally, this G is going to have a really nice property. And the property is that if I look at the powers of G, they're going to give me all the possible remainders modulo P. So if I look at G to the power of zero, which is basically one, G to the power of one, which is G, G squared, so on, all the way to G to the power of P minus two, this is going to give me all the remainders modulo p. So it's going to give me 1, 2 to p minus 1. All the remainders other than 0. Okay. So this is what I call a primitive root. So this kind of g is called the primitive root. 
or if you've done uh, group theory, it's also a generator of the multiplicative group. So you don't need to know that right now. It's just that I want to make sure the powers of G can give me all the possible remainders modulo P, except for zero, of course. Now, uh, well, which uh, means G itself cannot be zero either. Okay. So don't worry about how we actually uh, calculate this. There are algorithms that give you large prime numbers and it's actually quite easy to find primitive roots. So let's say that Bob could uh, calculate both of these things and I'm going to make G public as well. So Bob sends both P and G to Alice and Eve sees both of them at this point. Now, the next step is exactly what we had here, which is that each person chooses uh, some secret for themselves. So Alice is going to choose a secret A, Bob is going to choose a secret B. And hopefully they're going to choose it randomly. So let's say they have a random number generator on their computer and they use that to find uh, a secret. So Alice is going to compute the secret A, Bob is going to have a secret B. So this is my second step. Alice chooses some secret A. And this A is going to be, again, between 1 to P minus 1. And Bob chooses a secret B. And let's say they choose it uniformly at random. Now, remember, we don't want to send the secret itself. We want to send some function of the secret. Okay. So the function that I'm going to use is just going to be g to the power of the secret. So this is step three. Alice computes g to the power of a. And sends it to Bob. She can do this because she knows A. And on the other hand, Bob computes G to the power of B and sends it to Alice. Okay. So now Alice has sent g to the power of a to Bob, and Bob is sending g to the power of b to Alice. So at this point, this is the knowledge of Eve. Eve knows p, g, g to the power of a, and g to the power of b. Alice knows all of the things that Eve knows, but she also knows a. Bob knows all the things that Eve knows, but he also knows b. Now, here's the part where things get interesting. So Bob knows B and he knows G to the power of A. So he can just take G to the power of A and raise the whole thing to the power of B, right? And by the way, all of my calculations are modulo P. So this is G to the power of A modulo P. This is G to the power of B modulo P. Uh, generally, I don't repeat this, but all the calculations are modulo P. And this calculation is also modulo P. So because Bob knows G to the power of A, he can just raise G to the power of A to the power of B, which is his secret. He knows B as well. And that gives him G to the power of AB. Right? But Alice can compute the same thing. Alice can also compute G to the power of AB. But in her case, she knows G to the power of B, which was given to her by Bob, and she knows her own secret A, so she can just raise G to the power of B to the power of A. And that also gives her G to the power of AB. So you see both Alice and Bob can compute G to the power of AB, but Eve has no way of computing it because Eve only knows G to the power of A and G to the power of B, but you can't compute g to the power of a b based on that information. Okay, 
So now we can use this G to the power of AB as our shared secret, as our secret key. So we started with a situation where Alice and Bob had not communicated before, and we ended up in a situation where they have a shared key. And as soon as they have a shared key, of course, they can just use the one-time pad to send a message, right? So it seems magical, but it actually works. So let me just write the rest of it here. So step four is that Alice computes the shared secret K, which is going to be G to the power of AB. And the way she computes this is that G to the power of B is public. Everyone knows it. And she knows A. A is Alice's secret. So she can just do this. And of course, all the calculations are modulo P. And similarly, on the other hand, Bob can compute the same thing. So Bob computes the same K, which is G to the power of AB. But the way he does it is a bit different. He knows G to the power of A, which was communicated by Alice. And he knows B, which was his own secret. So and again, the calculations are modulo P. So they both have K now. And uh, finally, we have a shared key between the two sides. OK. Uh, and again, these calculations are also modulo P. So this is also g to the power of a mod p. This is g to the power of b mod p. OK. Now, let's just look at the point of view of Eve. What does Eve know? Eve knows what? All the messages that we have sent are uh, intercepted by Eve. So Eve knows these things. In the first step, we sent our prime number and our primitive root G. So Eve knows P and G. So she definitely knows P and G. But then we also sent G to the power of A and G to the power of B. So she knows those as well. Now, if she wants to find our key K, she has to be able to compute K based on this. So Eve knows these things and wants to compute K. And remember that K was G to the power of A times B. Now here's the part where uh, this lecture gets a little bit unsatisfying. We don't have a proof that this is impossible. All we know is that no one knows how to do this. So uh, basically, no one knows how to do this. Now, this is a little bit like the proofs of NP hardness that you see. So in your algorithms courses, you've probably seen that sometimes we prove that a problem is NP hard or NP complete. And then we pretend like that means there is no polynomial time algorithm for it. Okay. But the fact of the matter is that we don't know whether P is equal to NP. So when you're proving that the problem is NP hard, all you're proving is that no one, no computer scientist alive knows a way to solve it in polynomial time. Now, this is a very similar situation. Given this kind of information, no one knows a fast algorithm to compute K. And many people have tried for uh, several decades. No one has come up with anything. So our safety here, our security here is based on the fact that no one can actually do this, but we don't have a mathematical proof that it's impossible to do. Okay, there is a question in the chat. Uh, why do we mod everything by P? Uh, well, first of all, I want to make sure that all of my uh, numbers are going to be small so that I send messages of a fixed length. 
So if I have a fixed P, I can know exactly how many bits I need in every message. And then all of my messages will have the same length and that doesn't leak any information. But then the other thing is that uh, we have this problem that given G to the power of A, you should not be able to compute A itself, right? Because if Eve can just take G to the power of A and based on that compute A, then she can do whatever Alice can do. And uh, that's th that's a problem that's called uh, computing a discrete logarithm. And that's actually hard if your modulus is a prime number. So that's another reason why we're doing modulo P. And then finally, uh, one other point that I wanted to say is that this G is a primitive root. And because this G is a primitive root, basically the powers of G are going to be able to give me all the possible remainders modulo P. So this G to the power of AB, it can be anything. So Eve cannot rule out any of the possible values for the key here because G was chosen so that it was a primitive root modulo P. So this is another way where we're using that uh, P is a prime number and G is a primitive root. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this algorithm is usually called the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, but Hellman himself said that it should be called Diffie-Hellman-Merkel, and this is the same Merkel who created the Merkel trees. This is the basis of all of modern cryptography, basically, because it starts from a situation where you have never communicated before, and it ends up in a situation where you have a shared secret. And as soon as you have a shared secret, of course, you can now just use a one-time path. And there are other things that you can do as well. So we said that you should not reuse your key. So suppose that I want to send 100 messages. Should I do the key exchange a hundred times? Well, technically you can do that and it's not that hard because the calculations are quite easy, uh, but you don't need to. You can just exchange one key and as soon as you have this G to the power of AB, then you can just use a hash function. So instead of saying that my key is just G to the power of AB, I can say for the first message, my key is the hash of G to the power of AB. For the second message, my key is the hash of my key for the first message. And then for my third message, I just take my second key and hash it again and so on. Or instead of a hash function, you can also use uh, a random number generator like the rand function in C++ and you can just use this G to the power of AB as your seed for the random number generator. As long as both sides can get the same sequence of keys, you're fine. So it's actually possible to do just one key exchange and then have many different keys in common and then use all those keys to do one time pad. But uh, I'm going to end this session on the same point that I made here. Do not reuse your keys. It's fine if you have a key K and then you change it for the next time and so on, but you should never reuse the same key K to send two different messages. Okay, so that's it and I'll see you next week.